slightly different today um, and look at the, uh, the, I suppose, discuss the topic of payoff or rip off. So I guess what we're looking at here is we're, we're very conscious um, that there's a question, you know, are you paying for more than you actually need? Um, when you look at ITSM tools, um, we're, we're certainly aware that many ITSM tools have become very bloated. Um, and as you'd expect with that, um, you know, the price uh, often reflects that accordingly, be it in terms of licenses, cost of licenses, or potentially the professional services uh, that come with it. So I guess we're going to kind of really discuss, you know, do you need to implement 700 or 500 lines of requirements that you may uh, quite rightly want to put in the tender? Um, or is it actually better off focusing um, on, on your core requirements and the core um, essentials. So I'm going to kind of discuss that at a high level um, and in terms of a demonstration we're going to kind of show you a few areas that we think are key to um, any service management system that you may use um, and of course the overall kind of underlying theme here is you know you have a hard uh, hard-earned ITSM budget and uh, an IT budget um, how do you get the most out of it effectively. So for those that haven't heard about Sunrise um, we're a UK software vendor. Um, we've well established now, been going for over 25 years. Um, we offer our software both on premise and as software as a service. Um, in terms of a software as a service offering, we have fully uh, UK hosted data centers, so your data never leaves the UK. Um, and also, our support um, is delivered uh, within the UK. Um, as you'd expect with a kind of well established vendor, we have hundreds of clients. Um, across all kind of sectors and verticals. Um, and in terms of the software, um, our software is 100% web based and we offer various flavors. We have a core ITSM template, really focusing on ITIL and internal support. We have a, a managed service provider template, looking at service providers uh, that offer external support and also an option for people that are looking to use it uh, specifically for a non-IT function, um, i.e. HR. Um, and I think to kind of wrap that up, the core ITSM template um, is really sort of designed and configured as an enterprise service management platform that can support all of your, um, your, your business units. So that's a little bit about who we are. Um, I wasn't going to go too much into the details of our customers, but here's a, here's a few examples for you just to kind of um, digest. Um, again, as you'd expect, uh, and as I mentioned earlier, this really spans all, all sectors and all verticals, be it public or private um, or, or non-for-profit sector. So in terms of the, the theme we're going to discuss today, so payoff or ripoff. So I guess what we're kind of asking here is do you validate all of your ITSM investment against uh, the actual return on investment that you receive. Um, I, I guess, do you look at the value of focusing on the core essentials or do you potentially risk just throwing money at the aspirational fit of a vendor's narrative, i.e., uh, you know, are, are you kind of swayed by what vendors say is the next best thing or what they believe you should do, or do you actually look at what's important uh, to you? And it's certainly an interesting uh, topic to discuss. For what it's worth, and I mentioned I've been at Sunrise over 15 years now, we'd probably say in our experience, and these aren't exact numbers, but more a kind of a, uh, a summary really of what we've experienced certainly over the last few years, that probably 70% of requirements that we get involved in with our customers are kind of core functionality. So, you know, base functionality that you'd absolutely expect to get from a kind of leading ITSM tool. But that also leaves 30% of functionality that actually may be aspirational. It may re very rarely be implemented. And actually, it asks a bigger question, is it actually needed? You know, would you be better off uh, focusing your, you know, focus on the core essentials uh, and actually making the best use out of the, the money and budget, the, the budget you have available? Um, and I suppose the final question, of course, is why should a vendor care if they're making money, i.e. is it in the vendor's best interest just to sell you as much software and service as you can? Um, we certainly believe it, it can be different to that, um, and I'll go through that as we go forward. I thought it'd be interesting just to sort of put up a couple of examples of requirements that we've had over the last uh, year or so. Um, this is an interesting one. So I guess if you kind of step back and, and reflect and think that actually um, this was in a uh, an RFI for uh, uh, someone looking to acquire a service desk tool effectively. Um, so if you kind of take in all of the processes here, I think it's probably fair to say that you no, know, absolutely. 
incident problems, service level, those sorts of areas would be key to uh, any service desk tool you would buy. But if you were selecting a tool uh, and investing your money, would you actually really want to look at workforce and talent management or um, strategy management as part of a service desk tool? Perhaps you would, perhaps you wouldn't, but you know, it is certainly an in, in, interesting question to pose, isn't it, in terms of selection criteria that actually is a, producing a list of all of these processes going to get you towards the right tool that actually meets your requirements? And here's another quick example as well, a, a similar theme really. This was a client who was looking to purchase a, a service desk tool, really focusing around incident uh, service request problem in SLA. Um, again, uh, 463 lines of requirements. Many of them, um, as I said before, probably 70% is a typical ratio, very valid requirements, um, areas they would want to focus on. But again, potentially a lot of the, uh, lot of the areas in here they're asking for, um, I guess could attract a vendor uh, to uh, quote a higher cost, but may not actually give the person that's looking to procure the tool the best value uh, and certainly would provoke that question. Uh, do they actually need uh, all of these 463 lines of requirements? So um, I, I guess we're not just looking here to, to, to sort of create comment and, and controversy. I guess what we wanted to do is kind of talk about um, how you could approach it and, and some suggestions from our experience. So I guess one of the things that may be obvious, but it's worth mentioning is absolutely focus on your core requirements. Um, that's the best way to make sure, not just as a slide says, to maximize your investment and focus on the areas important to you, but it also stops you being spread too thin. It's like anything in life. If you try to do everything, then naturally you'll probably end up doing each part um, okay, but you won't really be able to focus fully on each area. So not only can you potentially save your hard earned budget, if you focus on the core areas, you're actually probably gonna do a better job of implementing the areas that you actually need uh, from the service desk tool uh, and therefore realize that benefit both quicker uh, and hopefully realize more benefit as well. Um, the other thing, of course, as well, is to be clear on the total cost of ownership. Uh, again, you know, look beyond the licensing. Um, I guess, is it a, a modular product? Um, you know, you've heard lots of things mentioned today. Um, does all of that come, come as free? You know, do, do vendors charge for integrations and add-ons and bolt-ons? It's all part of the cost uh, that you need to consider. Um, and also on the professional services side as well, um, if you are looking to implement a large range of functionality will that cost you more uh, in terms of professional services um, when you don't actually need it all um, uh, certainly somewhat summarize we believe we can meet the complex requirements and um, we've got a very mature product now um, but also uh, we like to try and ensure that customers get value uh, and only spend the money uh, where they need to so in terms of obviously today's um, overall agenda it is absolutely about showcasing the software so to kind of tie what I've just presented into the demonstration, what we're going to do today is look at what we believe are some of the core areas that absolutely you want to look at within a service desk tool. Um, and again, some of these themes, uh, unsurprisingly, uh, you'll have heard already today. So we're going to look at the self-service portal, um, core out item, uh, core out of the box ITIL processes. Um, obviously is key to a, an IT service management tool, um, being able to integrate with other business applications, being able to automate workflow, and also kind of dashboards and reports uh, it, it is a big area as well. And on the last point, I guess, one of the things that Sunrise have done is we've partnered with the Service Desk Institute to offer uh, the, the performance results uh, report out of a box as standard at no extra cost. So they're basically a set of KPI reports that the Service Desk Institute believe a typical service desk may want to produce. So kind of tying that back to the theme really, um, if you're interested in reporting, you, know, you don't probably want to spend money chasing uh, or creating lots of ad hoc reports. We believe that the, the SDR reports give you a very good starting point in terms of your KPI reports without having to cost you uh, any extra money. So I'm just going to break out of the slides and we're just going to go into the software and focus on the uh, the areas that we mentioned. So the first thing we talked about discussing was the self-service portal.
I'm just going to log into the self-service portal. Um, again, we can use a single sign-on. So if you want to use SAML to authenticate into the application, you absolutely can do. The first thing you'll notice when I log into the self-service portal is here you've got an example of an enterprise service management dashboard. So as you'd expect, these dashboards are fully configurable. Um, and again, in this case, this end user um, would be working for an organization that's kind of promoting uh, uh, an enterprise service management view with lots of different departments and, um, and areas of your organization uh, within the self service, such as facilities, HR, um, and of course, IT. So if I am particularly interested in, in HR, I can click on this area and go to a specific dashboard and area um, based around uh, HR. Um, in this demo, however, we're going to focus more on the IT area. So if I drill down uh, on IT support, um, here you'll see a typical IT cell service uh, dashboard. These dashboards I mentioned are fully configurable, but what we've done for today's demonstration is just giving you visibility of some of the three or four most kind of used areas of functionality uh, within a self uh, service portal. So middle right, you can see announcement. So again, you don't have to email people. Uh, would it be useful to create a one-stop shop so you can push out useful information to the end user? And if they're interested, they can of course click on here uh, and see more information. Um, likewise, if you decide to implement knowledge management, um, would you like to publish FAQs, how do I, to your, your end users to encourage self-help? So if I come in here and search for an issue such as iPhone, um, I can have uh, solutions suggested. Uh, and if I click on that, it will take me to a knowledge article. Um, again, being HTML5 uh, web-based, you can have various ways of presenting data, be it formatted text, uh, embedded images, uh, streaming videos from areas such as Vimeo or YouTube, or also URLs that can link out to uh, external data sources as well uh, to provide further information um, and, of course, attachments. Um, if we go back to the dashboard, uh, again, you'd expect your uh, end users to be able to check the status of their current requests so they can basically uh, check a live view of how things are going. Uh, they can click on it to see more details. They can update it if they've got further information. All takes the, uh, uh, the end user away from having to call you and chase you uh, to find out what's going on. Um, and then, of course, last but not least, the main driver often uh, to go to a self-service portal would be, of course, to raise something new. So here you can see in this example, we have quite a mature customer whereby um, there's a number of different forms that I can use uh, to raise a new incident or, or request within the, uh, within the system. Uh, again, the, the different information may, may require for you to capture uh, different fields and different attributes. So if I click on, for example, I can't work, um, there's a fully configurable form there where I can fill in relevant information and then obviously submit that incident or request uh, into the application. There's also a chance to kind of encourage uh, self-help here as well. So going to a, a sort of knowledge area and kind of manually searching obviously requires some willing. So if we use the same example as iPhone, you'll notice as I start to type here, the system can proactively uh, suggest solutions for me um, as I go on to raise the issue. So some useful ideas there around self-service. And I think if I kind of tie that back to the theme, these are all things that are you know, core functionality. They're areas that we believe you can implement uh, relatively easily uh, within any kind of uh, mainstream service management tool without having to chase uh, those kind of peripherals that may not actually uh, give you value. So that's kind of the self-service portal. I'm just going to log out of that area uh, and just uh, go back to the main interface or go into the main interface actually for the first time uh, to cover off some functionality within here. Um, again, as I log in, you'll notice it's dashboard driven. So very much our application is around uh, configurability and dashboard. So all of you on the call uh, today may have slightly different roles in terms of what you carry out. So if you kind of imagine when you log in, you can see a different dashboard based on your own job role um, as soon as you log into application. And you can drag and drop the dashboards to move it around, create new dashboards, and have access to as many different dashboards as you need within the application. Um, I talked about the core ITIL processes. So again, in terms of Sunrise, 
we are not and never have been a modular system. So out of the box, without you having to uh, use any consultancy or buy any modules, you have access to all of the core ITIL processes and they are fully integrated. So incident request, problem and change, as, as you'd expect, make the, uh, uh, the core of that. Um, uh, SLAs, knowledge management, the asset management side come up a lot today. So you have a fully integrated asset management database. But also other ITIL areas like supplier management, looking at contracts, uh, service management are areas that you all get out of the box uh, without any additional uh, expenditure. And there's also, you know, beyond the ITIL elements, we have standard areas around processes that IT may want to track. Things like project management, uh, IT risk and government management, areas that you have that are behind the scenes, if you want to use them, you can enable them. If you don't need to use them, uh, you can simply disable them. I'm just going to give you a couple of examples just to kind of cover off some, some functionality. So if we go to log a new incident from the service desk point of view. So at this point, I'm putting on my service desk hat as someone that is perhaps, has perhaps taken a phone call uh, and um, is going to be logging a new incident or request within the system. Um, you've already seen the self-service portal. It's worth mentioning as well. We do also have the um email processor so you can send outbound emails but also receive inbound emails into the application and, and, and fully automate that so if you just simulate the service desk login instant for a new user you'll see all of the searching is dynamic uh when i searched in and also we have a, a useful feature called dynamic matching so the minute i chose my end user uh, who we'd call a contact the system's already told me all of our open incidents that might be useful to stop things like duplicates i also might want to know any items that they're using so if for example i promote this network printer and link that to the incident and actually it's telling me the link may not be with the person the link actually may be with the printer so if it's a network printer maybe someone else has already logged an incident for the issue I and mean, here you can see that someone actually uh, has already done that someone called chris so just trying to help you uh, as you go and raise an incident the other scenario and this kind of talks about the integration of the processes out of the box and the uh, uh, value for money um if i just kind of type in an error code 901 um as i t start to type a bit like twitter but on a smaller scale based on what i typed in the system's automatically suggested solution. So knowledge management is fully integrated out of the box without having to do anything else. Um, you see here it's suggested a knowledge article um, based on that particular error code um, that may be useful to the service desk analyst. Or two examples within one actually, um, perhaps let, let's look at problem management for a second. Maybe there's already an existing problem maybe it's not a knowledge article that can help you maybe it's an issue with the software where you've gone to the vendor for a patch or from or for some help so here it's proactively told me there could be a problem related to this uh, record before i even log it and if i want to i can choose to promote it uh, to uh, this particular record so here for example you may have an incident that's linked to a parent problem and then you can automatically update the uh the instant record when you update the problem so if you have like a, a many to one relationship that's something that could be useful uh within the application um which quite short of time today so i'm not going to go into too much detail around the instant life cycle the other area we talked about being core now is is automation but also integration to other applications so at the high at the highest level sunrise had a very powerful rest api that's deployed as a web service so you can have two-way inbound and outbound communication with any other applications now common examples are integrating to azure and a microsoft graph uh, and in fact you've seen some examples today where vendors use a microsoft graph so using the sunrise api uh, for example, you could uh, create an account within Azure or you could add a calendar entry uh, within someone's calendar directly from Sunrise. Um, other popular integrations are with things like Teams. So I thought it'd be nice just in literally in a, a few seconds to give you a couple of examples. So the first one here will be um, sending a message to Teams. So let's say I'm working on a major incident, but someone's also ha has a Teams channel. You don't really want to type in two places. So you might want to from Sunrise say, uh, we hope to have 
Uh, so effectively here, I could type in an update uh, in Sunrise. And then what I can do is I can share any of the fields from Sunrise and any free t uh, free flow text like you just saw um, straight into Teams. So you can probably see bottom right, but if we just jump into Teams, that's basically triggered via the API, uh, an update to a Teams, uh, an IT Teams channel to say, here's the various information uh, from the core. We hope to have an update. We've even got a link to the ticket uh, in Sunrise if you want to go straight there. And you can, of course, have two-way integration uh, to be able to send things from Teams, raise new instance and requests from Teams uh, if you wish to do so. Um, a very quick uh, further example, um, perhaps you want to integrate with a dev tool. So here I've got the option to send it to Jira. Now, what that will do is uh, Jira is uh, often used as a dev tool. So from within Sunrise, we've gone to our Jira instance that dev are using. Uh, we've raised an issue in Jira. Uh, we've received feedback from Jira. So you see we've now got the Jira ID as well as the status of it in Jira. And now we can have like that two-way integration whereby we've updated Jira so our developers can work on it. If we want to send further information to Jira, we can. And likewise, uh, Jira can write back to uh, Sunrise. So that's kind of uh, some of the core areas. The final one before I uh, press my... Uh, pause button hopefully right on time is just to look at the standard reporting and, uh, and information you can get out of the tool so we talked about the SDI reports these KPI based reports so I wasn't going to say much more than that really just to give you a quick visual view of that so there's around kind of 30 or so standard KPI based reports that the SDI uh, believe a typical service desk would want you to produce so um, if you go with Sunrise you have those out of the box the other thing that's proved very popular uh, is an extract and integration with Power BI. So again, some vendors in kind of embed Power BI or part of that functionality in their tool. The reason we use Power BI um, itself as an option is if you have Power BI skills, again, if we're, you know, we're looking at saving money and maximizing your investment, you don't have to pay the vendor to do this stuff. Um, this is just pure Power BI. Um, Sunrise have created a large number of reports and charts out of the box. So if you don't have Power BI skills, that's absolutely fine. You can just use a standard functionality. But if you do have Power BI skills, then you can use the, the, the Power BI desktop to create charts, edit them, amend them um, as you see fit. Um, and that just complements, by the way, our internal reporting. So we also have uh, an inbuilt report manager that allows you to create and schedule um, your own reports. So I think to kind of pause there uh, and, and kind of summarize, what we've tried to do is give you, a, um, I guess, provoke some conversation really around, you know, what actually do you need and what are your core essentials? Um, and hopefully give you a few examples um, of some areas that may be of interest. So thanks for listening. And at that point, I'll uh, hand back to David. Thank you, David. Thank you very much indeed. And again, listeners, if you've got any questions um, for David right now, ask them. Um, and before we move into the Q&A, um, I'm interested in that dynamic knowledge. I think we, we saw some of that today and sort of trying to enable people, you know, to, to grasp knowledge more effectively. Right. That includes any knowledge, really. And I'm really interested in, in uh, your approach to that, that dynamic knowledge and, and how easy it is to set that up. Because it looks great when you show it, when you see it interacting. How how difficult is is to set that up, David? What what kind of resources do you need? Human resources, and and how do you go about that? Yeah, great question. Actually, it's a really fair point, isn't it? Because it's very easy for me to sit here and and kind of show a demo example, but it's often interesting to kind of think how does that translate into real life? So I guess to answer the question, um, it's very straightforward to set up. So it works on a concept of tagging. So I guess the underlying challenge is you've, you've got thousands of incidents, problems, knowledge articles, changes. How, how will any tool kind of make the matching? So what we've put in is a concept of tagging. So all you actually need to do is to add a quick tag to a, to any record, which will kind of index it. Um, now, interesting, we sometimes get asked, can you automatically add a tag? Now, it's something we could have done, but actually, if you think about something like a knowledge article, we find there's more success if you make it part of the knowledge process. So if you accept that a knowledge article will be created and published and approved, we actually recommend that as you approve a knowledge article, you add the relevant tags. And, and we think that kind of 
pays back, David, because what that means is the, the minimal time it takes someone that's already going to be approving the article anyway, so there's no extra time by adding the tag, then going forward, any time a related article is mentioned, you're going to get the benefit of that um, kind of proactive solution being suggested. So it absolutely shouldn't take any extra man hours or, 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 or woman hours or people hours, as I should probably say. It's it's part of your, you know, it's part of the core functionality and the core tasks that you'll be doing anyway in creating problems or, or publishing knowledge articles. And it looked like it was, just to make sure I've got it, it looks like it was facing, customer facing through the the portal and sort of service task analyst facing as well and you could have two different types of content i'm assuming there david depending yeah. on which user or which i don't know i don't know uh, which person uses that uh, uh yeah absolutely david you got that spot on so um you know you you can effectively have like published knowledge that's via the self service and internal knowledge because I, I know sometimes there's questions around what do i want my end user to see basically so you're absolutely right that you know you can break it down and segment it however you want to but your most obvious differentiator is internal knowledge that it wants to see and customer friendly knowledge via the portal good okay brilliant well thank you for that david and you're going to stay with us because we're Sure. We're moving now to um, our next uh, our next Q and A session, which is great. So we're going to welcome back our guests from Manage Engine and Halo ITSM, 